Scarefest Radio is sponsored by Spirit Mechanics for your spiritual health and well-being. Find them on Facebook. M E C H A N I X. And by Coyote Chris Sutton, bringing light to the darkest places. CoyoteChris.com. The opinions, viewpoints, and beliefs presented on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the management, the affiliates, and broadcast partners, or the sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Scarefest! The guests of Scarefest Radio are selected and scheduled independently of the Scarefest Horror and Paranormal Convention. Appearances on this program do not necessarily reflect the itinerary of the convention. And hello everyone and welcome to Scarefest Radio, original broadcast date May 18th, 2018. And of course tonight we have a very special guest coming up here in just a few moments. John Bloom, you know him as Joe Bob Briggs from... Monster Vision and Joe Bob Briggs Drive-In Theater. My co-host tonight, making his debut as an actual co-host and not a guest or filler or whatever the hell he is, is the owner of Scarefest, Mr. Brandon Griffith. Brandon, welcome to co-host duty. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure. Hope I don't screw it up and we'll go from there. Well, that's about all you can hope for around here. Um, <laughs> We Now, okay, full disclosure, as always, I try to do at the beginning of the show. If you tuned in wanting a celebrity announcement tonight, except for, i got to remind everybody that Joe Bob Briggs is coming to Scarefest because someone actually posted on the banner this morning, we should book him. Somebody actually posted <laughs> that on the banner this morning. So anyway, uh, yes, he, he, he is already coming to Scarefest. We got that covered. We got that covered. But uh, no celebrity announcements otherwise, except I do have another speaker that we had not announced yet. I'll be uh, throwing that in in just a little while. Um, now, one thing, uh, after watching some uh, videos today from, uh, from Monster Vision and uh, Driving Theater, Brandon, now you said that you were going to build me an actual studio after we get through this scare fest. <laughs> are, That's the plan. Are you going to make it look nearly as cool as as Mr. Briggs's studios did? Well, I don't know if I can do that, but I will certainly do my best. <laughs> Just, you'll have to like carry some shit out of your office, you know, like, you know, like like this, <laughs> the life-size Millennium Falcon and a couple of skulls and uh so anyway, but uh I just wanted to, to get that in there. Uh, without further ado, uh, Joe Bob, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here, Wes. Um, now, right I love off, Lexington. <laughs> right off the bat, now this is totally, I guarantee you, I, I'm willing to bet you this is a question you've not been asked before. Um, now, first of oh, all, and the other thing is, uh, you must be a tough cookie because you're the first celebrity guest that I've had on the show that Layla did not send me a text saying, don't piss him off. So. Uh, no, it's hard to <laughs> piss me off because uh, <laughs> I've been through the wars too many times, you know. It's like, uh, you know, I do a column every week for Talkie Mag, and uh, sometimes there's 9,000 comments on the end of the column. I I learned a long time ago <laughs> not to get pissed off. <laughs> well, what I actually wanted to ask you, now I, I, I pulled up your Wikipedia page, and I have to ask, is your mom's name actually Thelma Louise? Well, yes, it is. That and, is the uh, coolest mom name, name ever. <laughs> that is the coolest mom name ever. I, I worship at your feet. That that right there ups your credibility with me, because I think having a, your well, mom's she name. goes by Louise because uh, her mother always went by Thelma, so uh, uh, so it, it's been passed down through the through her family. So, um, so uh, got there. See there, I've got the fluff out of the way now. I've got the fluff out of the way. Now, uh, the um. 
I, I got so many notes here. I'm not used to making notes about a guest. But uh, so basically, the first thing I want to ask you is, now I know you were you started out life, if you will, as a serious journalist writing under your, I'm, I'm assuming actual your actual real name, but um, then you transitioned over into this character, Joe Bob Briggs. What was the, how did that happen? Can you tell us that story? Oh, well, that's that's like nine questions rolled into one. But, uh, yeah, I started out in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was a cub reporter at the Arkansas Democrat. Uh, I was an apprentice copy boy, really, is what I was uh, when I was 13 years old and um, was a sports writer, uh, ended up as a sports writer at the paper, and um, uh, went to uh, college on a sports writing scholarship. And um, actually, I, I want to mention this because you guys are in Lexington. The sports riding scholarship was sponsored by the uh, Thoroughbred Racing Association. And so in the summers, I would go to Lexington and work on those uh, horse farms all around Lexington and uh, as, as, an, as a veterinarian's assistant. And um, the stuff we did was disgusting. I just won't go into <laughs> it, but uh, <laughs> I think you guys probably have seen it. But <laughs> uh, we did the breeding mostly. But uh, anyway, um, so uh, I, I ended up at the uh, Dallas Times Herald uh, as a as a as a reporter, columnist, whatever. And um, I was trying to finish a book, and um, uh, they had me like running out of town all the time, and I, c- I couldn't work on the book. And so the movie critic job came open, and the, edit- the entertainment editor was a friend of mine, and I asked her if I could take it over for a while. Uh, just just uh, until she got a permanent uh, movie critic, and so that I could stay in town, so I didn't have to run around all the time. And she said, "Fine." She said, "But you know, you got to review every single movie, right?" And I said, well, "Yeah, yeah, that's okay." <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, I did review every single movie, but I-, I hated the Hollywood mainstream movies. I just despised them. Um, and so, uh, the only movies I liked were the foreign films. Because think about it, by the time a, a foreign film, by, you know, there's 10,000 foreign films, right? And one a month makes it to Dallas, Texas. So it's probably going to be pretty good, you know, because they, they've weeded out the bad ones by the time it gets there. And then I like the films that premiered at the drive-in. And those films were never uh, screened for the critics. Um, they, you know, uh, they didn't screen... Uh, the Grim Reaper for, for me. They didn't screen, uh, Swinging Waitresses, uh, uh, Eager Beavers, uh, Graveyard Tramps. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't show any of these movies to critics. And so, uh, I started calling the distributor saying, Hey, I want to see these movies in advance. And they said, No, no, we never show these movies except for one guy, Roger Corman. And, uh, I got to know Roger and, uh, I sort of developed the idea that I would do, I, I said, you know, it's got to be a driving critic, uh, not just a, you know, main, not just these mainstream critics that ignore this stuff. And so I started my column, uh, Joe Bob Goes to the Drive-In. And um, uh, I, uh, you know, it, it became popular pretty fast. And um, it was the first column, I think, that, um, that, uh, there, there was actually one other guy. Um, there was a guy in uh, New York uh, named Bill Landis, and he did a famous uh, fanzine called Sleazoid Express. And he would review the movies in Times Square, uh, 42nd Street. They were the same movies that I was reviewing at the drive-in. So the two of us were the only two critics in America. <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to believe today when everything that's released has a thousand reviews on the Internet. But... Um, at that time, uh, these movies were considered disposable trash, so nobody reviewed them. So that's kind of the short version of how the column started and developed into all the other stuff. It's just the uh, love, love of those movies, love of those exploitation movies. But now, you know, it, it wasn't, and it wasn't just horror; it was uh, uh, martial arts action, um, but but basically movies that your mother didn't want you to see. But now, it. Uh, as, a, as an outsider looking in, 
the uh, the weird thing about it, and and uh, you've obviously embraced this fully, but I'm trying. You you and Elvira are the two that come to mind. That your people know you as your character. Now, of course, in your case, it was a it was a nom de plume. It was your alter ego, but um, to when people walk up to the street, I mean, have you do you ever forget your real name? <laughs> uh, no, but I can tell you a story about that. Um, you know, uh, for a long time, I was writing. I, I, uh, um, I would write serious stuff as John Bloom and uh, movie stuff and, and humor and satire as Joe Bob Briggs. And around, I don't know, 1990, I think, um, uh, an editor at the Village Voice called me up and he said, hey, I want you to do this article. And he describes the article and says, do you think you can do that? And I said, yeah. And I said, uh, and we're about to hang up. And I said, is this for John Bloom or Joe Bob Briggs? And he said, who's John Bloom? <laughs> and so uh, at, that point, at that point, I knew it was probably, um, you know, inevitable that I would do most of mo- the rest of my career uh, as Joe Bob. It's not a, entirely just a... a, a uh, it's it's not a it's it's not a fake thing. I don't say anything as Joe Bob that I don't believe as you know as myself. It was just a better name. It's just, it's just a, it was just a better way to go through life. <laughs> I like both your names, Brandon. Over to you. Well, I've got to say first off, so so tonight if I had a time machine, thirty nine year old Brandon would love to go back and tell pubescent Brandon. You may not believe this, but one day you'll get to talk to Joe Bob Briggs. So if I manage to get access to a flux capacitor, I definitely want to do that. And as a bonus, I would also tell myself, no parachute pants, no matter how cool you think they are. Tinted glasses and a porn stash <laughs> make you look older. Uh, it doesn't make you look older. It just makes you a hood away from being the Unabomber. <laughs> and, and if it was one of those things that, like, I had just one last second, it would be, whatever you do, don't Google Blue Waffle. And if you're out there, don't Google it, whatever you do. But that being said, I, I just want to say it's a real pleasure to talk to. I mean, you're such an icon. You know, going back and, and you know, this week I've been going back and watching clips of, of Monster Vision driving theater. And it just brings back so much. I mean, when I was younger, I had VHS tape after VHS tape of your shows. And in fact, they were the one tapes I would not tape over with late night Skinamax shows. So that serves <laughs> probably the highest compliment I can bestow. That's my own version of the hubbies. Well, thank you, Brandon. I mean, some of those shows did have Skinamax type films on them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was doing uh, when I was doing drive-in theater, you know, we just showed anything that uh, Showtime Networks had had bought in in uh, Europe and didn't know what to do with. And so uh, we had every we had every bad West German sex comedy you ever made. Uh, <laughs> so. So a lot of those were kind of Skinamax films, but um, no, thanks. Uh, I, you know, I should mention. Normally, I don't like to plug stuff, but you guys are talking about these 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 old shows. We're we're going to reproduce the format of Monster Vision in a 24 hour marathon um, called The Last Drive In. That's going to air on the Shutter streaming service uh, sometime this summer. So. Uh, it's kind of the return of Monster Vision uh, for 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 one night for 24 hour marathon. <laughs> so uh, uh, we actually did recreate that studio. We did recreate that set. Not quite as elaborate, not the same, but um, uh, uh, we we are going to do that thing. Now, I, I first read about that like uh, a couple months ago, and obviously the hype has been going on about it. And when you announced that, like uh, me and my friends, like everybody at Scarefest. We have just been absolutely hyped waiting for that because it's reminiscent of, of you know, obviously the new stuff. I'm really looking forward to it. Like the old, like when, when we did like the overnight, like Friday the 13th marathon, like I'm so looking forward to the shutter thing. Like I can't even begin to tell you. And it's, I think it's going to be great. Um, yeah, so, well, we had a meeting and they said, what do you want to do, Joe, Bob? And I said, well, exactly the same things I did twice before. So, so, <laughs> So it's not it's not much different from uh from either of the two previous shows but uh i you know i, I 
in in my opinion, it wasn't broke, so we're not we're not trying to fix it. And wow. uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, um, we'll see how it plays. They don't want. They don't. We're picking the movies. They don't want me to tell the titles because they want it to be like a surprise event. You know what the um, what the marathon movies are. Anyway, I, it's 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 a range from uh, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, in terms of uh, the. <laughs> The, the types of films we're going to show. So, so this is streaming now. So, I mean, before you know, it was it was cable. So, like, is this going to be an unfiltered, you know, Joe Bob on on Shutter? Like, I'm I'm really curious to see what that would look like. Yeah, well, um, yeah. I mean, it's a, a, a Shutter is owned by AMC Networks. It's their streaming service for horror, and um, and and yeah, it's it's like. Um, uh normally you just go and you look at the menu and you stream whatever you want to stream this is a special event this is going to be you got to you got to tune in and watch it live on the night that it airs it's not like you can watch it 2 days later you got to watch all, the whole 24 hours <laughs> and, and i'm going to do a quiz at the end on my website there'll be 10 questions you'll have 10 minutes to answer them and if you didn't watch the whole 24 hours you won't be able to answer them so uh, and we'll give away prizes. So uh, it'll be it'll be fun. Or right, get our international uh, energy cocktails out and get ready to go. And like, I, yeah, we're, we're gonna definitely the family, the, the Griffith household is gonna partake in that. Now I'm I'm 39 now. I don't know if I can do 24 straight hours, but I'm gonna do my damnedest. All right. Well, I, if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I age in dog years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a streaming service. It's, um, it's, uh, I mean, everything's eventually going to be a streaming service, right? So, uh, uh, it's a little bit ahead of its time in the horror field. Well, I know that's what we're all counting on, uh, because doing, I'm streaming everywhere. I'm going to go ahead and cut in now. We're going to do a commercial break. Everybody, you're listening to Scarefest Radio. Do you feel lost in life? Do you seem to be stuck in emotions that are not yours? Is your home not the sanctuary it should be? Contact Spirit Mechanics, where they take a team approach to your metaphysical and spiritual problems. Spirit Mechanics specializes in aura cleansing, stone attunement, attachment removal, and house cleansings. Spirit Mechanics tailors their approach to your individual spiritual path and needs. Find them every month at Lexington, Kentucky's Mystical Fair, mysticalfairlex.com, or on Facebook by searching Spirit Mechanics, that's M-E-C-H-A-N-I-X. Spirit Mechanics, for your spiritual health and well-being. And welcome back to Scarefest Radio. Um, I do want to go ahead and get our little announcement tonight. Nick Brown, regular at Scarefest, part of the staff even, he's coming back with another speech this year. Uh, he is speaking on werewolf culture. Werewolf culture. Uh, it has to do with culture in the... Werewolves don't have a culture. No, he's saying it's in the movies. He's, it's, it's in the movies and, and TV. So, um... Nick Brown is added to the speaker list. Now, uh, Joe Bob, uh, I do want to get a couple of questions in from the chat room. Uh, first of all, okay, did you get in trouble? Did you, in fact, get in trouble for your review or your your live review or whatever it would be called of Barbarella? Um. Well, I can. I no, I don't think I did. Um, I mean, uh, the, the programmers. This this is when it, when I was doing Monster Vision on TNT, and the programmers would occasionally consult me about what movies we were, we were going to show. It, it was you know they would they would ask me what did I want to show, and then they would pro- usually ignore me. But uh, but occasionally they would say, hey, you know, uh, we've got the licensing rights to, to they would 
to this movie, uh, we're going to put it on your show. What do you think of that? So they came to me and said, we're going to show Barbarella. And uh, at the time, Ted Turner, the owner of the network, was married to Jane Fonda, the star of Barbarella. And I had always read that she hated Barbarella. And she hated the guy that she was married to when she made Barbarella. And so I was like, no way. Do, do not put that on my show. I said, I'm surprised you guys didn't want to put that on the network, but do not put that on the show. I said, I said, I, you know, I, it's hard enough for me already to fly under the radar of these guys. They're watching me <laughs> like a hawk everything I do every week. You think you want to put a Jane Fonda movie that she hates on my show? And, and they said, oh, come on, it'll be fun, you know. Ted has a sense of humor, and I said, well, maybe Ted has a sense of humor, but maybe Jane doesn't. I don't know, you know, and so, and so they kind of forced it on me, and uh, I was kind of like uh, going easy on the, on the, uh, on the, I mean, talk about it in a movie, it's easy to make fun of, you know, but, but um, we showed it, I waited for the axe to fall the next week, um, I never got any any memos or anything, and so I guess I escaped to that. That's another narrow escape. I had several like that at TNT. <laughs> now, our other question from the chat room: Tell us a story of how you got on Casino. Um, well, uh, i I was on uh, I was on the Movie Channel for nine years, and and uh, they changed formats, and I. I didn't have a, a, a TV gig anymore. And so um, for about six months, I mean, maybe maybe less than that, um, I, I just went on auditions, and which is a bad thing for me because I'm terrible at auditions. <laughs> and so, uh, but one of them that came up uh, during that time was um, Casino. And so um, the Casino, uh, the uh, casting agent um, uh, called and said, you know, uh, can, can you come in and read for this? I think you'd be right for this. And so, you know, it was kind of, it, it was this dimwit Western character, you know. And so uh, I said, um, yeah, sure, you know, what kind of movie is it? Oh, it's a Martin Scorsese movie. And I go, oh, my God. Okay, so... Um, so I got the, you know, the, the script, the little, the little sides they give you and, uh, started working on it. And, um, then she calls back and she says, you know what? She says, Marty's going to be in town next week. I'm going to have you read for Marty. We won't have you, bo we won't bother with you reading for me. Have you read for Marty and go, Marty, Marty, Marty. Oh, that's what they call Scorsese, Marty, you know, <laughs> And so I'm going, oh, my God, now i got to, like, I'm calling up people. Hey, would you come over and please run these lines with me? I'm going to read from Martin Scorsese. You know, this is like, really, I'm a, I'm a horrible auditioner. This is going to be horrible. And so then she calls a couple of days later, and she says, she says, we're going to have you read for Marty with Bobby. Bobby is what they call De Niro. And I go, oh, no, I don't really want to read for Marty with Bobby. But, uh, you know, so now I'm, like, terrified. I'm terrified. And I go to the uh, audition place, and the, audi the, the outer lobby is full of these uh, gangster guys, the guys you've seen in um, uh, Goodfellas and all those movies. You know, the, you, you would know the faces immediately. And they're all from Jersey, and they're all complaining about their parking validations and stuff. And um, I'm like, oh, my God, it's like, I'm like in Scorsese world and I don't really belong here. And so, um, they finally called me into the room where I'm going to read. And, um, uh, Scorsese walks in and he goes, what do you think is the best women in prison movie? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, uh, I don't know, uh, Mr. Scorsese, I think probably chained heat would be my choice, but maybe you have another <laughs> And he said, no, 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 I think that's right. I think that's, that's a good choice. <laughs> so it was like breaking break the ice, I think. And then uh, De Niro came in, and De Niro didn't know his lines, and he didn't have his glasses, and he had to stare straight, straight at the paper. And so I was saved 
I was saved because I didn't have to look into De Niro's eyes when I did the audition. So anyway, I thought afterwards, I thought, well, that was an interesting experience. You know, I can talk about it later. And then they called the next day. They said, well, come, come to Vegas and do the part. So that's the story. That's my story of, uh, of how, how, how I ended up in casino in that little, that little period between, um, uh, drive-in theater and monster vision. I think I was off the air for like four months or something, you know, it was from the last uh, drive-in theater to the first monster vision. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon now. Uh, I do want to remind everybody after the next commercial break, we will be doing the three day pass giveaway on this Facebook group page, the scare fest horror celebrity fandom and Halloween expo. That's the one I've already put a post up. It says contest here. You can figure it out. Just go to that page, and we will be giving away a three-day pass to ScareFest 11, ScareFest Rebirth, ScareFest uh, XI, if you want to say it in Latin. So, Brandon, over to you. Well, one thing I've always kind of wanted to ask, and, and this is just my, my inner fanboy, like, so coming up with, with the Shutter thing and everything that you've, all, you, you know, you've done up until now, like, you, you've always seemed like the Encyclopedia Britannica, for, for all things like horror film, movie related, like it, it's, it just blows my mind. And so your take on everything has just always been really honest and straightforward. And, and I guess I'm just wondering, like, are you, are you just that geeky with these things like I am over the films or like, is it like cramming for a test or, or how, how do you go about? Oh, getting ready I, for no, that? I'm, a, I'm, I'm extremely geeky. I look up every detail I've known to, I, I've been known to read, every single not just every single fact on imdb but every single user review on imdb you know when i'm really when i'm really into a movie and some of those films some of those films they've got 500 user reviews you know so um so uh when i'm really into a film i'm really into the film um but uh, i'm definitely not i mean I, i'm frequently introduced as an expert but there are guys that I meet at conventions like your own. And, and by the way, uh, you're, the reputation of um, Scarefest, Scarefest uh, precedes you. I've, I've, I've heard many, many good things about your, about your event. Okay. Um, but but I, I run into people who, um, uh, who come up to me at those cons and ask questions where I realize I am a baby compared to what they know there are guys who never leave their apartment okay they have seen a hundred thousand films so I'm, I'm by no means the world's expert on um, exploitation films or even one of the subgenres of exploitation films there are guys who there are always guys who um who who know more who are deeper into it you know uh so um um but yeah, when I prepare a show, when I'm gonna, when I'm going to do a show, uh, I do want to know every single thing about the film. I, I don't I don't I, I I love the internet for that because when when we were doing those shows, um, uh, we didn't have the internet. Uh, even even after we had the internet, there wasn't any information about these movies on there. So we we had. Uh, uh, some films where we couldn't find any information on him. We couldn't even find the director. We couldn't even find out if he was alive. We didn't. We didn't know where he was. You know, we we would we would try to find people who worked on the crew of the film just so we could get a little background. You know, uh, of course that's those days are gone because you know there's virtually nothing that's not known about these films, and that's a great thing now. Uh, but at the time we were we, we had to dig and dig and dig to to find anything on these films. There were a few books. There were some, uh, uh, you could occasionally find a magazine or newspaper article. You'd have to go to the library to get it. <laughs> you know, um, so, uh, it, you know, uh, it, it was really hard, uh, uh, to do that. So you mentioned earlier, like talking magazine and like some of the, uh, your, your, um, your contributor uh, there. So like I, I read recently, like, please, it's a horror film. And, and I thought that was really good. And it kind of gave me, you know, your thoughts on like current film and stuff like that. Like, could you elaborate on, on that piece a little bit more? And then also like for, for us fans, uh, which that piece, which, a, please, which it's a piece horror I didn't, 
Please, it's a horror film where you talk about um, Get Out and It and, and some of the newer movies. Oh, oh. Was- oh yeah. Well, I, I was just saying that um, when Get Out first came out, I was uh, uh, the biggest biggest supporter of it. And then, and then the people who lo- who love it and the director of it kept making more and more elaborate intellectual claims for its for it, which is something that frequently happens with a successful horror film. And and often they, what they say is, well, it's not really a horror film; it's a thriller. It's not really a horror film; it's a sociological document. It's not really a horror film; it's this. And so over time, you know, it's like you guys are talking too much. Shut up. You know, you're like ruining the film. And then um, it came out, and I thought, um, I thought, even though it was acclaimed because it was the most successful horror film in history in terms of dollars, um, the the guy from Argentina who directed it didn't get any credit. He didn't really, he just didn't show up on anybody's radar, and partly because he wasn't originally the guy who was going to direct it. No one was, he didn't have a big fan base or anything. He was brought in and, and, but I thought, look, this guy did this amazing movie with six child actors, six child actors. I mean, come on, you know, is that an achievement? That's a, that's an achievement. It's like, nobody does that. Nobody put, puts their whole, you know, the whole arc of the story and the, and, the, and the whole success of the film completely on child actors. And that's what he did. And I thought that was a huge achievement. And um, he didn't really get the credit. So I was writing about, you know, how some films get overpraised, some films get underpraised. But it was, it was still a great year for horror. And, and you know, the, the winner of the Academy Award shape of water that i mean that's a monster film so even that's a horror film and so uh you know it it was kind of a it was kind of the horror year uh as far as the mainstream accepting um uh horror films that would normally be in the indie world so so with the shape of water like that that turned into more like that no this is this is a quote that i've heard from you before i believe it was like the shape of water turned into like romance and adventure versus like a sex and violence kind of thing. And it seems like horror always gets branded with the, the sex and violence. And then we have this monster feature come out with shape of water. And, and it, it just, it took a different turn. Like with kind of more, it was a creature flick with some romance. Well, in it. Yeah. It some I mean, it had that fantasy glow about it. And so it was, um, uh, you know, the, the great thing about, um, it, it, I mean, it's Guillermo uh, del Toro is one of a kind uh, director, and his 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 films have all these horror elements, but the, but they're also very uh, um, uh, they're very uh, female friendly. If you if you uh, chart on most horror films, uh, how many males watch it, and how many females watch it generally 70% males and 30% females on a Del Toro movie. It might be 60 feet, 60% female, 40% male. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be, it's going to have a different quality about it. And it's going to be, um, uh, in, in my opinion, an advance, an advance in, in what people can do with horror. And you see a lot of mainstream film directors who put a lot of horror elements in films that are not horror films. We're, we're in an age where everything gets mixed together, you know, so uh, um, it's all good. It's all good. And the fact that all these streaming services exist and they're all uh, competing, I read somewhere there's 200 streaming services. Um, that's great because that means they've got to find new films, <laughs> got to find new content. And uh, that means we're going to have a lot of films the next few years, a whole lot to watch. Okay, let's uh, cut in here. We're going to go to our next commercial break. Everybody, you're listening to Scarefest Radio with our special guest, Joe Bob Briggs himself, Mr. John Bloom. Coyote Chris Sutton. Shamanism. Spiritual advisement. Paranormal investigations. Inspirational presentations. Bringing light to the darkest places for over 20 years. Go to 
CoyoteChris.com to learn more. Okay, everybody, we're going to start off the uh, this segment with uh, go to the Facebook page. And the first person that under our banner for tonight's show that I just posted that says contest entries here, the first person that comments on it with what movie you would like to see given the drive-in theater treatment, the Monster Vision treatment, Mr. Joe Bob Riggs, we're, uh, he'll probably ignore you like I would, but but the first person that posts the movie that they want to see done. Um, now, Joe Bob, now one thing, okay, you mentioned about this, uh, the streaming services. I agree that it's a new it's a new world out there for filmmakers, but the problem I'm having with them is every time that uh, I'm supposed to do research for one of these episodes, I've, I've already got three of them. I've got three streaming services, and guess what? It's always on the one that I haven't paid the $10 a month for. Yep, and <laughs> that's only going to get worse. That's only going to get worse. Don't expect that to get better. Have, have you ever tried to find something old on Netflix? Don't bother. You know. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been very, um, I've but, been very disappointed with Netflix lately. Yeah, um, they're they're you know they're moving towards Netflix is just becoming another Hollywood studio. So uh, their focus is on original content, and uh, they're doing really well with that. Uh, but they're but what they were doing ten years ten years ago. Um, uh, when they had all those uh, older films and older TV series and things, that's not going to be their uh, role in the future. And other services are going to move in and have some of that stuff. Uh, Disney's going to have its own streaming service. Um, uh, Amazon Prime should be a major streaming service, but they just <laughs> stick it on Amazon like it's one of the shopping options. You know, it's like it's not... <laughs> You know, like it's, you know, order some groceries or stream a movie. You know, it's like, um, <laughs> it's just buried. It's just buried on the Amazon site. It's like they've, they've actually got a lot of good movies, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's just doesn't seem like it's a big deal to Amazon. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, we all know the big ones, but there's going to be a lot of, uh, smaller ones too that, um, and 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 the more some of the more specialized ones are going to be more expensive than the general ones, and so everybody who cut the cord on cable because it was the, the price was creeping up, they can find out a couple of years from now. You know, they thought, well, I'll have one streaming service and I'll save all this money, and they're going to look at their bill and they're going to have eight streaming services because <laughs> because there's stuff they want on all of them. You know. So it's now, going to be just like cable. The bill is just going to become like a cable bill. Yeah, that that's definitely where mine's going. Now, a question before I get to the chat room questions. Uh, what do you think about all of these remakes that have been... I mean, it, it's always been a few, but it seems to me lately they're taking classic, beautiful movies that have aged well. It's one thing to give it a new a new look. You know, so you know, it didn't do just where it didn't go where it should the first time, but now you know. Then they come out with yeah. it, and, and I just, I don't embrace it. How do you feel about them? Well, uh, um, filmmakers are in the business of making money. Film companies are in the business of making money. Um, the first time around, on most of the most of the horror remakes that you're you're talking about, uh, the first time around. They were released theatrically or on VHS or on DVD for a limited specialized audience. And then over the years, they have developed a following and a name and, and a place in the pop culture. And so when you do the remake, you have a huge audience. Well, that's not true of other genres, you know, a, a, a a comedy that made in 1963 was already in the mainstream, and so it's kind of it's it's kind of hard to 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 score with it. Um, you know, they made it before, but it 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 uh, um, 
you know, it did it it, 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 they had to wait till 2018 to make $200 million. So that's why they do it. Um, most of them are not. Um, most of them are slick, um, well, ex- well executed, and, and, and don't have a lot of soul to them. Um, the, uh, uh, I wish they would take movies that had failed, um, uh, or, 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 you know, had potential but failed and remake those, <laughs> you know, because, you know, do a better job, you know, sort of the way that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we revived Broadway musicals, you know, you, you want to see it with a new person, you want to see it with a, with a different cast, you want to see it with a little bit of a different way of telling the story, you know, so you, you could do that also with movies, but that's kind of not what they do. They, they just, they go for the, lowest common denominator they don't they don't do anything really uh special with it you know when they remade texas chainsaw massacre uh they had uh, more money um more professional acting um better sets better cinematography they had better everything pretty much and there's nothing wrong with the movie there's absolutely nothing wrong with the movie except it just doesn't have that gritty, scary feel <laughs> that the original movie had. You just feel like you're watching something that's well-made, but it's not that scary. Um, and that's a problem with both, most of these big-budget horror remakes. They just they don't have the, the, the soul of the original creator. And now, I don't know uh, if you agree, but... <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, no, actually, that, that part, now, I absolutely agree with that. Um, now, a couple questions from the chat room. First of all, and this one might as well have been written in Chinese, what are your thoughts on elevated horror? Elevated horror? That's what they ask. I have no idea what it means. The Towering Inferno? I don't know what that means. (laughs) There, there, good. What's elevated horror? I do not feel like (laughs) such a dumbass now because an actual film buff doesn't know what he's talking about either. Uh, but, okay, now I do have one here that I, I've, uh, I know is a softball for you. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. They want to hear the story of your cut scene. Okay. They were filming Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 in Austin, Texas. Um, I was sent down there by um, Rolling Stone magazine. I went down there to write an article on uh, Dennis Hopper because Dennis Hopper was doing his first movie in years. He was coming out of rehab. He'd been in rehab for a while. And um, uh, he said he told his agents the first movie he wanted to make was um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. They tried to talk him out of it. They said, you know, he's going to kill his uh, already faltering career. And he said, no, I love Austin. Willie Nelson's going to be there all summer. I want to hang out with him. And so he goes and, and he makes Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. So I'm down there to interview Dennis Hopper. And um, in the meantime, they tell Toby Hooper, the director, that, hey, that guy that always writes about Texas Chainsaw Massacre and, you know, loves it, he's here. And so Toby comes comes out of his trailer and he introduces himself and he says, he says, would you, would you be in my movie? Would you please be in my movie? I'm like, okay. And, and he says... Um, here, work with, this is Kit Carson. He wrote the movie. Work with him. Write, write a couple of scenes. I want to put you in the movie. I want to put you in the movie. And so um, Kit Carson and I went off and wrote these two scenes. And uh, uh, we shot the scenes. And then uh, about two weeks before the movie came out, uh, Toby calls me up and he says, Joe Bob, I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. They're cutting the movie for running time. And, t- t- uh, you know, those two scenes we shot... That's two of the scenes that they decided to take out. And I said, well, I'm shocked, Toby, that those two scenes didn't fit the overall narrative arc of the film. (laughs) I'm just shocked that two scenes that you just invented on the spot when you were wandering around the set uh, were were considered not relevant to to the development of the plot of the movie. So it didn't bother me that much, but he said he, but he felt, he he felt bad. Then when the DVD came out, they put them back in the. Uh, they put them on his DVD extras. So 
there actually is some way to see them. I think they're not color corrected and they look kind of grainy, but, uh, but they do, they, the two scenes do exist. So, um, it's a kill scene. It's a Leatherface uh, kill scene. Okay, before I before I kick it back over to Brandon, I do want to remind everybody, yes, Sandy Alvarez did game the system and win another ticket, but she's coming anyway. So we're but if somebody else will post a movie, by the way, uh Joe Bob, she wants to see overtime the movie, uh, given your treatment. But I will take one more winner because it's not a coming out of my pocket, it's coming out of Brandon's. So we will take one more winner on Facebook if somebody wants to post a movie that they would like to be seen given the drive-in theater treatment. Brandon, over to you. So, one thing I was curious about, like, are you still doing, like, the one-man show or a variant therein? Yes, I do a show called um, uh, How Redneck Saves Hollywood. That, that's my most popular show. It's got about it, it's got about 300 uh, clips and stills in it, and it goes in about an hour and a half, and it's... it's um, it's the whole history of the redneck as told through film. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and, and I used to think that I could only do it in the South. Um, but last fall, I got invited to do it in Boston and every redneck in Boston showed up, both of them. And, uh, I did the, I did the, uh, uh, the show up there and, and, and they, they were okay with it. They were okay with it. So, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, uh, uh, maybe book it in some, in some, uh, places in the north. But, um, um, I, ha- now I have not done it in Kentucky. You guys find me a theater and I'll do, uh, I'll do, uh, uh, How Redneck Saved Hollywood. Well, now we have a theater and I saw that <laughs> and I'm, I'm extremely interested. And, uh, I am from Eastern Kentucky, which is Appalachia, so I could probably go into that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's all about Appalachia, as a matter of fact. I mean, the whole first part of the film is about Appalachia, the whole first part of the show. But, uh, um, yeah, I usually do it at an at an indie theater, like a, you know, uh, the art local art theater or someplace like that. And, and uh, I did it at the uh, Texas Theater in Dallas, you know, the theater where they arrested Lee Harvey Oswald. Um and uh, uh, they they get it there. They understand it there. <laughs> well, so, I've, always, uh, I've always wanted to be in a situation where I can say this. Uh, I'll have my people talk to your people. <laughs> that, sounds, okay. that sounds pretty cool. No, I, I actually love to do the show. It's an exhausting show. I mean, exhausting for me. Not exhausting for the audience, but it's an exhausting <laughs> show for me. But I like to do it. I enjoy doing it. Yeah. So other than just out of personal curiosity, like um, me, me and my wife, like we, we try to go to shows like in and around the area and different festivals and stuff like that. And we've never been to the Chattanooga Film Festival, but I've heard a lot of great things about it. And I, I know you're kind of a staple there from what I can understand. And like, I think you do some other stuff too. Like, do you, do you like if, if, if beyond Scarefest, like other parts of the year, like what, what other film festivals and events can we find you at like coming up? Well, really, the Chattanooga Film Festival is the only one where I go every year, uh, just because um, uh, I, I uh, they they let me do these wild clip shows that I do, and uh, uh, and they, they're they're big fans of genre films, and especially horror films, and so uh, it's just a it's just a uh, nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that I get there. So I go there every year. Uh, otherwise I just go to whoever invites me. I'm not, uh, I, I don't have a plan. Um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the worst places to go to in, in general, the smaller the uh, town or the smaller the region that you're in, uh, the more exciting the festival because, um, the worst festivals you can go to and the worst conventions you can go to, are in LA and New York. Uh, they're just like jaded people. They just don't, you know, they've seen it all. <laughs> they, they, they don't get excited. They don't laugh. You know, they kind of sit there stoned the most of the time. And so, you know, <laughs> I, and so, um, 
uh, and so, uh, you know, some of the best experiences I've had at conventions and festivals have been in, um, uh, kind of out of the way places. Um, uh, you know, Lexington has more of a cosmopolitan feeling because of the university, but, uh, but, but sometimes you'll be in, in, uh, in places where, uh, horror is the main thing that they do, you know? Um, horror convention is not like a sci-fi convention. You know, you go to a sci-fi convention and it's kind of like upper middle class people from the suburbs, you know, have a lot of money. You go to the horror convention and it's like, um, a lot of, um, a lot of tattoos, a lot of bikers, a lot of people who come up to me and say, you know, I was a misfit and your show legitimized my feeling about these movies and, and it's like, it's sort of my crowd. It's like, I, I like that crowd better than, uh, than, um, the, uh, the sci-fi people who pay 300 bucks to get their picture taken with William Shatner. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't work on his horse farm, did you, when you were in Lexington? I don't know if I worked on his farm. You know, I, I just, I mean, I didn't see anything except, you know, giant horse dicks for, for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we did nobody, <laughs> no, nobody made you like milk the bull and pull that that classic uh Eastern no i remember Eastern. no i remember the, fir- the first day i ever went to the breeding barn they said uh you know we got to explain this to you joe bob uh every time sperm comes out of this horse it's fifty thousand dollars so we're going to get the sperm out of this horse <laughs> and so that's what we did we got the sperm out of the horse <laughs> That's also, yeah, my uh, my dad. We uh, we had a thing like we did, we <clears throat> we had a pig farm, like pigs on the farm. Like we uh, did a like a smoke every year, and it but had the, sperm, thing, like, the, the the semen was much cheaper. It, it, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, like he had me measure the pig's tail, where he held his, the pig's uh, tail with his hand, took my hand and counted up with fingers, grabs my wrist, and then just shoves it forward. And so it was uh, <laughs> that was our family joke on the farm. <laughs> Oh so, wow! So, so coming up with, with, I want to go back to the to the shutter thing real quick because, like, I, I don't know how much you can tell us or you know what what you're allowed to give away, but if there's anything that you could you could throw as as just a teaser, I, I mean, I would welcome it. I've had people messaging me all day. Um, it it is going to happen. It's 24 hours. Uh, it's probably going to be a Friday night to a Saturday night. Uh, it's the old Monster Vision format. Um, it's uh, commercial interruptions of the movies, even though we don't have any commercials. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any commercials. So it's really just me annoyingly interrupting the movie. Um, so uh, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's Monster Vision all over again. It's just that, you know, I'm probably going to talk a little more than I used to talk, although I, I talked quite a bit on Monster Vision. Um, the, um, uh, the great thing about Monster Vision was uh, they sort of didn't care when we started and when we finished. And so, if you'll recall, you didn't ever know when the show started. It could be on after the basketball game or whatever. And, <laughs> And and they said as long as you're finished by six a.m., we don't really care how long the show is. So that meant they didn't really care how long the segments were at the commercial breaks. So, you know, sometimes we finish at three in the morning. Sometimes we finish at four thirty. Sometimes we, you know, it didn't matter. They just fill in with cartoons or something until the broadcast day started at six a.m. I don't think there's any place on TV today <laughs> where. <laughs> where that system would exist, you know? So um, one reason that the uh, show was so kind of freewheeling is that uh, we didn't really have to answer to anybody about uh, how long the stuff was. And um, so uh, this 24-hour marathon is perfect for me because I can talk for 24 hours. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we've got uh, a huge library of films to choose from. And uh, when I was uh, talking to the guys about, you know, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to show classics? Do we want to show um, great films? Do we want to show 
bad films that are fun? Do we want to show a film from each decade? What do we want to show? And they were like, all of the above. We want to do all of the above. We want to do everything, everything. You know, <laughs> and so and so it's kind of a grab bag of um, of uh, various things. We chose some stuff where I'm personally involved with the film, so uh, I have stories to tell about it. You know, that probably nobody knows and things like that. But um, it's 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 a it's it's a hodgepodge. Okay, everybody, this has been Scarefest Radio. We've pretty well, we've used up all of uh, Joe Bob's time that we that he allocated for us tonight because he's he's a busy busy guy. And uh, but this is actually this is all the time the affiliates give us, so we gotta we gotta like get moving here. So anyway, uh, Joe Bob Briggs, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight, and I'm looking so forward to meeting you at Scarefest this year. Thank you, guys. I'm looking forward to going back to Lexington, and uh, we'll try. We'll try to make the experience much more pleasurable this time. Than... Yeah, I, I, no, I'm not going near the. I'm not going near a horse while I'm there. <laughs> so, everybody, this has been Scarefest Radio. I hope you enjoyed it. See you next week.